Bonjour à toutes et à tous, et bienvenue à cette rencontre Forum Veritas, organisée par les GBU, les groupes bibliques universitaires de France, et en partenariat avec le comptoir. Et aujourd'hui, on va avoir un entretien d'une heure environ avec le mathématicien John Lennox. Cet entretien va se faire en anglais, et tout du long de l'entretien, vous pouvez poser vos questions, qu'on fera remonter tout à l'heure, dans le chat YouTube, et vous pouvez poser vos questions en anglais ou en français. Hello everyone, um, welcome to this Forum Veritas event organized by the GBU, the French Christian Unions, in partnership with the podcast Le Comptoir. Today's event will be an hour-long interview with mathematician John Lennox. This interview will be in English and you can put all your questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, les, les groupes bibliques universitaires sont une association culturelle uh, qui réunit des étudiants pour réfléchir autour de la Bible et de son enseignement. Et les forums Veritas, dans lesquels nous organisons euh, cet événement, visent à mettre en dialogue euh, la pensée chrétienne avec d'autres visions du monde. Et le comptoir, avec qui on organise également cet événement, c'est un podcast euh, des groupes bibliques universitaires qui réfléchit à la culture, la société, la science, la foi, et qui propose euh, des chroniques, et des interviews et même des morceaux de musique. Euh, comme je l'ai dit, tout le reste de l'entretien maintenant va se faire en anglais, mais vous pouvez toujours poser vos questions en français aussi dans le chat YouTube. So I'm Joshua Sims uh, and I'm a PhD student in theoretical chemistry at the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon. I am Elsa Dallahoyd. I'm a sixth form student in year 13 at the Lycée Maurice Rondeau, specializing in maths and computer science. Et je This... suis Jean Lennox, professeur de mathématiques émérite à Oxford. Et... Malheureusement, j'ai oublié presque tout mon français, mais je veux dire euh, que j'aime la langue française. Je lis beaucoup de livres en français euh, et euh, c'est un peu difficile euh, quand on n'a pas de partie de parler dans un entretien compliqué comme sur les sciences et Dieu. Mais j'espère que vous... Uh, allez comprendre mon anglais. Je suis en Irlande. Je suis d'Irlande du Nord. Merci beaucoup. This lunchtime, we're privileged to have an hour-long interview with mathematician John Lennox. Our speaker is John Lennox. Good afternoon and welcome. John Good Carson... afternoon. Good afternoon. John Carson Lennox is a mathemat mathematics professor specializing in group theory and a philosopher of science. He is Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Philosophy of Science at Green Templeton College at Oxford University. He is also Associate Fellow at Said Business School and Senior Fellow at Trinity Forum. Thank you for joining us for this lunchtime interview. It's my great pleasure to be with you in France. Um, the interview will take place as follows. We'll start out with a roughly 30 minute interview after which you will be able to ask John Lennox uh, your questions. And so as we've been saying in French, you can ask your questions in the YouTube chat uh, and we'll uh, be able to then ask them to Professor John Lennox. So we're going to start up uh, the questions. Um, first question, how did you become a Christian? My parents were Christians and my first impression of Christianity was that it was real in the lives of my parents. Now, I need to explain that. Northern Ireland was at that time a very difficult country because there was the beginnings of terrorism. There was conflict between two religious sides, Protestants and Catholics. And we lived in one of the most dangerous parts of Northern Ireland. My father ran a store and employed maybe 30 to 40 people. The interesting thing is that he employed people from both sides of the religious divide. And he was bombed because of that. And I once said to him, Dad, why do you do this? It's very risky. He said, look. On the first pages of the Bible, we read that all men and women are made in the image of God. And therefore, all of them, 
independent of their worldview or religious affiliation or none, they are to be treated with dignity, and I intend to do that. Now, that made a very deep impression on me. Their Christianity cost them something. It was ethical. It was real. Secondly, they loved me enough to allow me to think for myself. They did not force their Christianity down my throat. So very early on, as a boy, I was convinced that Christianity was true, and my parents opened up to me the truths on which it depended. So almost as young as I could understand at the age 9, 10 perhaps, it was perfectly clear to me that I was not born a Christian. I had to become a Christian. And that was a wonderful thing because God does not force us into Christianity. And I learned from my parents that Christianity is not religion, ritual, and rules. It is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through trusting him. And I learned to do that very early on. And as I grew older, my conviction grew because I studied not only Christianity, but alternative worldviews. When I was about 14, my father gave me a book and I said, what is it? He said, it's the Communist Manifesto. I said, have you read it? He said, no. Well, why should I read it? <laughs> he said, you need to know what other people think. That was the kind of background I had. And it was wonderful because it opened my mind intellectually. I was allowed to ask every question. And the more I exposed my Christian convictions to very critical intellectual investigation, the more I was convinced that it was true. And that's how it began. Of course, when I came to Cambridge in 1962, then I had the opportunity to demonstrate whether it was real or not. And so how, you mentioned you were going to Cambridge um, then to launch into uh, scientific studies. Uh, how do you reconcile your Christian faith uh, with scientific investigation, if reconcile is even the right word for that? Reconcile is not really the right word because think about history. History is extremely important. And the origins of modern science lie back in the 16th and 17th centuries, starting perhaps with Galileo, then Kepler, and then Newton, and coming on up to Clark Maxwell, Faraday. And the interesting thing that I learned very early on was that all of these people believed in God. They did not see any conflict between their faith in God and their faith in science. And may I emphasize that faith is as necessary in science as it is in Christianity, but we may want to discuss that a little bit later. C.S. Lewis once summed up the famous uh, <clears throat> Alfred North Whitehead's comments on the origin of modern science by saying this, he said, Men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. So it seems to me that, let me put it this way, I, I'm not ashamed to be a scientist and a Christian because arguably it was Christianity or the Judeo-Christian worldview that gave me my subject. After all, the beginnings of science are found in the Bible, where God told human beings, according to the account, to name the animals. And taxonomy, or naming things, is the fundamental intellectual discipline. So I see that science and faith in God sit very well together. My biggest problem is that science and atheism don't go well together. But that's a different question. Yeah, and just on a more personal level, um, how does your uh, Christian faith, your belief in God, um, sit with your peers? How do your colleagues react to that? Do they are they surprised that you can have uh, you can be a scientist who believes, or does it seem not that surprising to them? It depends on who the colleague is. Uh, in Oxford, I have many very bright colleagues, much brighter than me, who are Christians. 
uh, some of them heads of department, famous scientists, physicists, electrical engineers, um, chemists and physicists. And so uh, some, of course, uh, are rather curious. I find there's more curiosity than antagonism, very much more curiosity, because I have the dubious reputation of having challenged Richard Dawkins and a number of other leading scientists who are atheists. And it's quite amusing, actually, because even some of the atheist scientists in Oxford thanked me for challenging the kind of atheism represented by Dawkins, because they think it is not warranted. So curiosity is the main thing. I've never found it the remotest disadvantage. And indeed, these days, having become old, I find it a positive advantage because it makes me, as the police say, a person of interest. And so how have you seen the academic world change around the question of science and faith um, generally? Okay, now let me just say something about what you've just said. Science and faith. We need to be very careful here because science is a set of academic disciplines. Faith can mean two things. And I take it you mean faith in the sense of religion because faith is also subjective belief. And the difficulty with science and faith, let me put it this way to you. And this isn't a criticism. It's just what happens all the time. People say, will you give us a lecture on science and faith? And I say, but do you want me to talk about God? And they say, yes, of course. And I said, it's not in the title necessarily. Oh, yes, they say it is. It's faith. Look, I said, I can talk to you about science and faith without mentioning God because faith is essential to science. Oh, we mean faith in God. Well, that's good. But we need to explain that to the audience. It's okay to talk about science and faith in God, but it would be better to talk, to balance it about faith in science and faith in God. Let me quote Einstein to you. Einstein once said, I cannot imagine a real scientist without that faith, not faith in God, but the faith without which science can be done. In order to do science, I must believe that science can be done. Now, what does that mean? I must believe that the universe is, at least in part, open to the human mind. Or to put it more precisely, I must believe that the universe is rationally intelligible, mathematically intelligible. That is the basic faith of a scientist. And we hope it's evidence-based, just as my faith in Christ depends on certain objective things, particularly his resurrection and my personal experience. So faith occurs everywhere. So once <laughs> we've cleared that up, I may then address uh, your question. And just as in science, you can be more precise as I just say something briefly and then you can take me up on whatever you want. But there seems to me a fundamental thing. Faith is evidence-based if it's worth talking about in any area of life. A person may believe that England will win the World Cup, but it may not be based on very much evidence. We have to, when somebody asks us to believe them, we look for evidence. So trusting people, trusting uh, claims, propositions, if they're not evidence-based, then we need to be careful because then we'd be guilty of blind faith, and that's dangerous. So in the scientific area, we look for evidence. In Christianity, I look for evidence equally. And as in science, it's of two kinds. There's what we might roughly call objective evidence, the facts as we understand them, although I'm perfectly well aware and uh, that scientists are human beings. So they bring their own worldview to bear on their science. They try to avoid it, but it's impossible. 
It is exactly the same with any worldview and in particular Christianity. We bring a frame of reference, a lens through which we look at the world. And we have to be careful that of the prejudices that that brings. And I'm prejudiced, of course, but I hope my prejudices are well informed. So asking for evidence, there are different kinds. There's first of all, the history of science, and I've mentioned that briefly. Then there's the philosophy and nature of science, what science actually is, what it can do, and perhaps more importantly, what it cannot do. And then there are the results of science. And similarly, when it comes to my Christian beliefs, the Christian faith in the objective sense, there is the evidence of history. There is the evidence of its philosophy, the way in which it satisfies the fundamental criteria of truth, like consistency and corresponding to objective reality. And then there is the criterion of experience. And I use all of those tests in both science and in my relationship with God. So in a very real sense, there's an equal balance. And perhaps the most important thing to say is the difference between science, faith in science, and what science does, and faith in God and what that does. Let me explain that briefly. In general, science, and I'm passionate about it, it's very powerful. Why? Because it asks a limited number of questions. And the main scientific questions concern how things work and the why of function. Why is this bit there and not there? But the why of purpose, the teleological questions, strictly speaking, most people will agree, do not belong to the natural sciences. Now, I realize here's a problem. Uh, certainly in English, we use the word science simply to mean the natural sciences. In French, it's a bit broader, I think. And in German, Wissenschaft means both the natural sciences and the humanities. I'm passionate about both, by the way. But if we're talking about the natural sciences, then they do not ask, answer the meaning question. And this is hugely important because many people I talk to today, especially students and professors, their main question is about meaning. And I often illustrate the difference by raising the question, why is the kettle boiling? Now, the scientific answer to that is something like the gas flame is heating the molecules of water and they are moving more and more rapidly. And that's why it's boiling. But actually, I can say as well, it's boiling because I want a cup of coffee. And I do want a cup of coffee right now, but I'm not going to get one. But anyway, you see, those two ex explanations, the scientific one in terms of the way heat works and the human one, human desire, I want a cup of coffee or tea, those explanations do not conflict. They do not contradict they complement. And I find it difficult to understand why intelligent people cannot see the difference between those two explanations. Richard Dawkins thinks that the God explanation is the same as the science explanation. That's nonsense. That's like saying the explanation for a motor car engine in terms of physics, of heat, and internal combustion is the same as the Henry Ford explanation. And often when I speak to young people, I say, look, here are two explanations for a motor car engine, the physics of heat and internal combustion and Henry Ford. Please choose which is the right one. And even young children down to eight or nine years old say, but sir, you need both. Now, if people could see that the God explanation is like the Henry Ford explanation. It would take a great deal of heat out of the so-called conflict between God and science. Let me put it this way. God no more competes with science or conflicts with science 
as an explanation for the universe, then Henry Ford competes with heat physics as an explanation for the motor car engine. They're complementary explanations. And that's hugely important. And actually, when it comes to coffee and tea, people have been drinking them for thousands of years before they understood the science of heat. The explanation in terms of human meaning outside of science and in general is the most important explanation. And when we're looking at the universe, you see we've got two approaches. We've got the approach of science, which is fascinating and has yielded some marvelous results, but it doesn't answer the question, why is there a universe? What's it for? We must widen our evidence base in order to get answers to those questions. Why? Because natural science does not give them. Yeah, and so you've mentioned this idea that um, too many people, I won't generalize to everyone, but see, um, don't make this distinction today between uh, the, the purpose uh, and the uh, natural explanation for why something's happening. Um, why do you think it is that science has tended to lead people to the impression that we uh, don't need a kind of purpose explanation to things, or you, you said a teleological explanation? This is a, a very interesting question, Joshua. Some people just deny the validity of the purpose question. I was at a book launch once, and Richard Dawkins was in the audience, and a person asked why, and he interrupted and said, that's not a valid question. Well, of course, that's absolute nonsense. I think, let me, let me invert your question. What we're dealing with today in, in the academy, sadly, in many countries in the world, is not science, but scientism. And scientism, I think it's le scientisme in French, is the idea that science is the only way to truth. Now, I love logic, and it's very easy to see that that is nonsense because the statement, science is the only way to truth, is not a statement of science. It's a statement about science. And if science is the only way to truth, it cannot be the way to the truth that science is the only way to truth. So there's a logical incoherence there. And that's why I tell my story about the, the boiling water to indicate that science, yes, it's powerful. It is one of the ways to truth, but it's not the only, nor is it perhaps the most important way to truth. But many of our leading culture influencers believe in scientism. The late Stephen Hawking did, and Dawkins does, of course, and, and there are many other major people. But I can see that nowadays, Serious-minded thinkers realize that cannot possibly be the case. And I see cracks in that argument. But many young people are being convinced that it's true. Now, you use the word need. Now, that introduces another aspect of this. I don't need to have God uh, in order, order to understand the universe. That's a very subjective statement. It's not actually a very... Uh, scientific statement in that sense. And there are two questions here. It was Hawking who said, I don't need God to light the blue touch paper of the universe. Well, actually, I think he's absolutely wrong because he did not give any explanation of why there is something rather than nothing, the famous question of light bits that I've written about in detail. And so... I myself feel that this scientism must be strongly opposed by people in academia like myself who, who see how misleading it is. Also, I think the need uh, is very much related to the want. And one or two scientists have been very honest and open, saying they don't want there to be a God. Uh, and that's honest and one can accept it, but it's an emotional reaction. It's nothing to do with science or evidence. 
And so the key question to my mind is not do I want or do I need, but is there a God? What is the truth behind all of this? Because it's very odd that people who stand for science and so-called objectivity often talk in terms of needs and wants and emotions. And their reaction to the whole topic of God is almost purely visceral. It has nothing to do with evidence. I don't know whether that answers your question, Joshua. It does, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, knowledge and new technology now. Um, and so I've got a question. Um, what is your point of view on the evolution of technology and all the new technologies that are uh, coming now? <laughs> that, Elsa, that is a huge question. And I'm just about to write the second edition of my book, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. There are many new technologies, and I'm using one of them right at the moment to talk to you all. So I'm very grateful for technology. That's number one, particularly communications technology. And you can see me and I can see you. Now, there are technologies based on the difference in our faces, facial recognition technologies powered by artificial intelligence. They are marvelously useful if you are a police force and you're looking for criminals in an international football game. But that very same facial recognition technology that's powered by artificial intelligence can be used to suppress a whole population, which seems to be happening in, in China with the Uyghur population. What I'm saying now to you is technologies are like a sharp knife. A sharp knife can be used for surgery or it can be used for murder. In other words, any technology has got an upside and a downside. And so therefore, with the technology, we need to think about the ethics. Now, the technologies that are bothering us at the moment are mostly in connection with what's called narrow AI. They're technologies that actually work General AI or artificial general intelligence is still a pipe dream and probably will never happen in the way some people hope. The idea of creating a super intelligence that will destroy us all and all the rest of it. I can comment on that in detail if you wish me to. But I think it's very important to realize narrow AI is a computer-based system with a large database that typically does one and only one thing that normally requires human intelligence. And it's those technologies that have been hugely beneficial to humanity in the development of vaccines and new antibiotics. They've just solved the superbug problem. They solved the folding problem for large molecules of DNA, et cetera, et cetera. But they are also behind chat GPT, and two and a half thousand leading scientists are so concerned about where that's going that they have imposed, are trying to impose a ban on it for reasons that are not entirely clear. And we're getting a lot of hype. Uh, one side of it is doomsday. We're going to destroy the world in a couple of years. The other is saying, don't be ridiculous. We haven't advanced to anywhere near that. And so what I've tried to do, and I'm rewriting the book, it's a much longer book now, to try to explain there are two sides, there are too much hype, and we need to sit back and think about this. But the most important thing to do, we need to think about the ethics, because it's so obvious the technology advances and evolves, to use your word, Elsa, far faster than the ethical reflections to control it. And the central problem with new technology of the advanced kind is called the control problem. How do we avoid it running away from us? And because some of the leading people who founded some of this technology are distancing themselves from it because they feel they have lost control in two senses. First of all, they don't really understand how it's doing what it's doing. 
and they're concerned that what it's doing may have unforeseen consequences that could be dangerous, if not disastrous. And that is not helped by some of the leading scientists in the world adopting the doomsday scenario, whereas there are others who do not. So it's a very complex situation. And what I say as a Christian believer, I want to see people who are who have faith in God involved as scientists so that they contribute not only to the science, but also to the ethical under, underpinnings. Because one of the most difficult things that's going to be is to regulate AI technology. Vladimir Putin said a couple of years ago that the person who controls AI controls the world. And I suspect there's a lot of truth in that. Now, that may not answer your question, but it's a start. Okay, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned it might just be a pipe dream, but the, the very idea of artificial intelligence, which could um, maybe someday rival um, human intelligence in some areas, raises the uh, deeper question, I guess, of what makes us human? Uh, what distinguishes yes. us from, from that? Um, where does uh, uh, dignity come from? Uh, and is it just from our intelligence? That, that, that is the key question, actually, which is why I called my book Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. It, and that's why I got deeply interested in the subject, because as a human being, and as I hope someone who thinks about life, that is absolutely the key question. Now, to your first comment, AI is already outsmarting human beings in many areas, doing things much faster and conquering areas that people thought machines would never conquer, like playing chess, that was long ago, playing Go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And narrow AI, and it still is narrow AI, it really works, it is doing incredible things. And watching chat GPT-4, for example, spewing out all kinds of talks and essays and passing second year medical exams in America and all this kind of stuff shows that, that we're dealing with very, very impressive technology. Now, remember what I said earlier, narrow AI typically does one thing that human intelligence is needed for. The word artificial, as someone beautifully put it many years ago, a Christian actually, who was in the foundation of AI, he said the word artificial in the phrase artificial intelligence is real. That is, it's really artificial. It is not real intelligence. It doesn't think. It has no motivation. It does not sense emotion etc cetera, etc cetera. and we've got to remember that a number of leading people uh, <laughs> someone said recently one of the founders of the web said ai is no more likely to come alive than your toaster uh, <laughs> the thing that makes toast for your breakfast in other words it is a machine and here i want to say quite a number of things because Machines are important, but human beings are not machines. Now, how do we know that? There are things that, mach that machines cannot do that humans can do. Now, one of the areas in which that is apparent is mathematics. There are some very complex things in mathematics known as Gödel's theorems. And uh, Roger Penrose, one of the brightest mathematicians probably who's ever lived, who's in Oxford still at a high old age, he believes that the human mind is capable of doing things that are non-computable. That is, they are not capable even in principle. And that can be precisely defined in terms of Turing machines and mathematics of being done. So that humans are simply not machines. And however advanced the machinery is, you are never going to uh, reproduce what it is to be a human being. That's point number one. 
Point number two, another difference is machines cannot recognize qualia. That is our experience of what it's like to, what it's like to see a color, what it's like to smell a smell or taste a steak. A machinery cannot do that. In fact, we do not know what that is in the sense that all of those things are linked with consciousness. And the pipe frame part of what I was saying is no one is anywhere near making a conscious entity because no one understands what consciousness is. And indeed, the leading people in AI follow Turing, the original genius, who made the point that the real game to be involved in is the imitation game. In other words, AI at all of its levels is simulating human intelligence. It's not replicating human intelligence. And that is extremely important difference. So that human beings are different. Now, I want to add as a Christian a very important dimension that human beings, as I said at the beginning of this interview, are made in the image of God, in that they are persons of intelligence linked to consciousness. Machines are certainly not that. So we reflect the image of God. And let me put this another way, which gets to the very heart of Christianity and where I stand. Human beings are utterly unique. How do I know that? Because God became one. Now, that may surprise many of you listening to me, but that is the center of Christianity, the word who is God. This is a word-based universe. Science shows that very clearly. You can describe the universe in terms of mathematics. And in genetics, the, one of the most important things ever discovered is the genetic code. And the human genome is 3.4 billion letters long, exactly in the right order, like a computer program. This is a word-based universe. The explanation for that, the only one that I can see makes any sense at all, is that it was created by the word, who is God, a personal being. And the central claim of Christianity, without which I wouldn't be talking to you today, is that the word became flesh, the word became human and lived among us. That's a colossal claim. Jesus Christ claims that he is the word become human. Now, if human beings are the kind of being which God can become, then they are utterly unique. Humans model 101. Now, that has huge ethical implications because some people are saying, human beings, no, 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 no. This is just a stage in the ongoing change of human beings. So we have to genetically engineer them, attach them to technology, and turn them into gods. Now, I'm quoting to you Yuval Noah Harari, who is one of the leading exponents of this, and I interact with him a great deal in my book, 2084. Thank you. Um, we have got a lot of questions for our viewers, so we're going to try and answer as many as possible now. Um, we're going to start with the question. You talked about uh, science and how it's actually not difficult to reconcile faith and religious faith with science. Um, but then you said it's difficult to reconcile atheism with science. Why is that? Well, I often, when I meet a famous scientist, which I do a lot, I ask them what they do science with. And they often say, well, I've got this million dollar machine in my lab. And I say, no, 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 I, I don't mean your machinery. What do you do science with? And they say, I do it with, and then they hesitate. They're about to say mind when some of them remember that it's not politically correct to use the word mind. They say, I do science with my brain. Now, I happen to believe the brain and the mind uh, are not the same, and I've written about that, but it doesn't matter. I say, okay, we'll go with that. You do science with your brain. Tell me about your brain. Where does the brain come from? 
crisp, brief description. And here it comes. The brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided, natural process. And when they say that to me, as many have, I smile and I say, and you trust it? Tell me, if you knew that the computer you use every day or that million dollar machine in your laboratory was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? And I always push for an answer. And I have many times and always had the answer, no, I would not. So I said, you have a problem. You're telling me you trust your brain, which you believe is the result of a mindless, unguided process to do science. You have a real problem. And I think it is a fundamental problem, actually. Now, various people have drawn attention to it. C.S. Lewis was one of the first. And he said, because he, although he was not a scientist, he understood the philosophy of science. And he said, any explanation that undermines the validity of human reason cannot be true because you reach it by using reason. You have to trust reason to reach an explanation. And then various other philosophers have built on it impressively. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> one of them is uh, an American philosopher who has written a great deal about it, Alvin Plantinga. But perhaps the most interesting comment is by Thomas Nagel. Uh, Plantinga is a Christian philosopher. Nagel's an atheist. And he's one of the people that doesn't want there to be a God. He's very honest. But he wrote this amazing book. I couldn't believe its title when I first saw it. It was, um, the subtitle was uh, that the neo-Darwinistic explanation is almost certainly false. And I thought, what? Here's an atheist writing this, this, this book. And I read the book several times over. And he makes the point that there must be something wrong with the explanation I gave earlier of the brain. A naturalistic or materialistic explanation of the brain cannot be right because we want to trust reason in order to do science, philosophy, and everything else. So there's something seriously wrong. Now, because uh, Nagel is essentially a materialist, he does not believe in God. He's desperately looking for a materialist answer, and he can't find one. And as another famous philosopher pointed out, he really ought to be a theist if he follows the evidence where it leads. So it seems to me that I'm not prepared to believe nonsense, quite honestly. And therefore, I see atheism in a deep conflict with science. And Alvin Plantinga, in one of his major books on the topic of philosophical books, says, at the superficial level, there appears to be a conflict between science and religion. Um, but at the deep level, there is accord. Whereas at the superficial level, there appears to be a concord between science and atheism. But at the deep level, there is a very, very big conflict. And th that is where I stand. And I notice an increasing number of leading thinkers, not only in the natural sciences, are becoming rather dissatisfied with materialism. And they formulate it like this. They say there must be something more. And there's a whole range of them. Uh, the brilliant historian who wrote the book Dominion, Tom Holland, is one of them. Ian McGilchrist is another, the, the absolute polymath, uh, psychiatrist who wrote this huge book, The Matter with Things, uh, and a number of people like that, most of whom I've met. They, that fascinates me because I, I've been expecting it for a very long time, and it's coming in a way that I must confess I very much welcome. Mm. Um, another question here, this time about artificial intelligence. Uh, the question is, if we create intelligence that is conscious, it's a big if, but if we do, and we call it artificial intelligence, does that mean that we are artificial intelligence in the eyes of God? Well, it's such a hypothetical. 
if the person asking the question will tell me what intelligence actually is. You see, we're dealing with imponderables. And until we have the remotest clue of what consciousness is and intelligence is, the only thing you will create that's worthy of the name intelligence. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm happy to use intelligence defined as simulating what a human being can do. That's okay. And machines can do that. Computers do that all the time. And so, and so does AI. But if you're talking about the creation of something that's conscience uh, and life, I wouldn't have a clue how to answer that because I, I suspect myself that you're not going to do it because of the kind of reason, uh, and it's not a visceral reason, it's a scientific reason, because all of the things that you are doing are based essentially on computing. And there are things that are non-computable. So you, no matter how long you try, it's like the perpetual motion machine you're probably well aware that in science, as anywhere else, it's difficult to prove a negative. But there are some things even in science that are proscriptive, and one of them is perpetual motion. And I used to get papers, I don't get them anymore, but I used to get lengthy papers written by people, usually handwritten, saying, I have discovered a perpetual motion machine that you don't need to put energy into it, you get energy out of it. Now, I never read them, not because I'm an obscurantist, but because I know the principle of conservation of energy. Now, it would appear, it was suggested by a Nobel Prize winner, Sir Peter Medawar, who worked in Oxford, that there was an analog of the conservation of energy principle and its conservation of information, that no machine could generate novel information, but could only process information either in its input or in its informational structure. That, if it's true, and a large number of people believe it is true, would completely stop any notion that you're suggesting. So I remain a profound skeptic, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um... Now we've got a question about um, the, the scope of science. You highlight that understanding intentionality, why the water is boiling, is currently outside the scope of science. Um, do you uh, think that this could be integrated to a science of mind, as Charles Taylor argued for cognitive science? Thank you for that. That's a perceptive question. Let me give you another tack on it. There was a famous philosopher, whose name I will recall in a moment, who in high old age, he'd been an atheist all his life. He was the Richard Dawkins of his day. But when he was faced with the information content on the DNA molecule. He became not quite a theist, but certainly a, a deist. And he was challenged with this, that this was outside science. And his reply was, look, I followed the evidence where it leads. Now, the relevance of that to your question, and it's a question that interests me greatly, is if we are allowed to follow the evidence where it leads, then there are things within the natural sciences that seem to point beyond the natural sciences. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein once said, the meaning of a system will not be found within the system. I think that's a very profound insight. Science appears to point beyond itself. For example, the beauty, and I'm a, I've got a Fairly, a fairly impressive telescope in my garden. The beautiful of beauty of the universe points, beauty points towards something other. Mathematics points to something other. And I believe they, they, they point to God. Now, if we were to say, why don't we just follow the evidence where it leads? Then we would find that these things that point beyond the natural sciences 
are pointing us to another rational dimension. Now, I mentioned that in that way because the big problem is that scientism, science is the only way to truth, has led many people to think that science and rationality are coextensive. Now, that's sheer nonsense. If science and rationality were coextensive, every French university would have to close half of its faculties, the history faculty, the philosophy faculty. And I know in France, closing the philosophy faculty would not be popular. So <laughs> it's just a nonsense to say that the natural sciences are coextensive with rationality. Putting that another way, it's not irrational to look beyond the natural sciences to an area which Charles Taylor, as you say, described as a major cognitive area. And I do that all the time. I write about that. I've just written a major book, Cosmic Chemistry, Do God and Science Mix, which is discussing cognition in, in fair detail, because I just think it's very important we go there, that no areas off limits. In other words, if people want to shut themselves in a cause and effect closed system, which is effectively what many of them are doing, they may do so, but they must be told that you've shut yourself in. There's a big world outside that you could rationally open your mind to, but you've convinced yourself that rationality and the natural sciences are coextensive. So Lennox, when he talks about these things, is completely irrational, which is, I hope, nonsense. Good okay, question. Thanks. Um, another question here. Um, do some areas in mathematics, uh, such as the existence of infinities of different sizes, bring you closer to God? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I, 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 I take the point. Uh, there was a time when I was just fascinated by the different infinities and Cantor's arguments, and all this kind of thing. What mathematics did for me was to, first and foremost to teach me logical thinking teach me to think axiomatically. And also, the thing in mathematics that brings me nearest to God is the fact that it can be done. You know, here's a mathematician, and she's thinking in her head, and she comes up with an equation, and it applies to the sunspots, for example. And I ask, how is that possible? that this thing that's written down in this specialized language of pure mathematics can have any relationship to what goes on out there. A very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist called Eugen Wigner wrote a paper that's much loved of mathematicians in 1961. It's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. Why does it work? And that's what Einstein commented on when he said the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. How is it that we can understand the universe mathematically? Now, you see, Wigner was an atheist. I am not. I talk about the reasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Why does mathematics work? What is the explanation? Ultimately, it is because the universe out there and my mind that's studying it are ultimately the creations of the same intelligent God. So I'm not surprised that it works. It's reasonable. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to say in conclusion? I would like to say how much I've enjoyed talking to you. And merci beaucoup pour les questions. Questions très profondes, questions très importantes. J'espère beaucoup que vous allez dans le futur penser aux questions et soyez ouverts pour la possibilité que Dieu existe et qu'il veut avoir une relation avec vous. Bon voyage Bien, merci beaucoup, jean Max. Euh, juste avant de, de se quitter, je vous propose euh, juste quelques annonces très rapides. La première chose, c'est qu'il apparaît à l'écran euh, 
un QR code vers un questionnaire d'évaluation. Si vous pouviez prendre juste une minute pour répondre, ça nous aiderait vraiment beaucoup. Ça permettrait de savoir ce que vous avez pensé de, de notre temps ce midi et d'améliorer par la suite. Donc, euh, il y a également le lien du questionnaire dans, la description, dans le, le, le chat YouTube. Oui, et si vous avez apprécié euh, cet événement, sachez qu'il y a des milliers d'heures d'enregistrement de conférences de ce type disponibles en replay sur la chaîne YouTube Forum Veritas France que vous voyez sur l'écran. Et euh, la prochaine euh, rencontre Forum Veritas, euh, ça sera mercredi, donc après-demain. Euh, ça sera un débat euh, qui se fera euh, le soir à 20h euh, avec euh, Cédric Villani qui est médaillé Fields en, en mathématiques et Antoine Brett qui est physicien. Euh, autour de la question, euh, les mathématiques peuvent-elles ouvrir à la spiritualité euh, Vous pouvez retrouver le podcast du comptoir euh, sur le lien dans le chat ou avec le QR code sur l'écran ou en, sur les plateformes de streaming audio Spotify, Deezer et YouTube si vous cherchez le comptoir et GBU. Euh, on a également un site qui s'appelle fondsenquestion.eu euh, okay, sur lequel vous pouvez trouver des, des réponses à vos questions sur la foi chrétienne. Cette soirée était proposée par les groupes bibliques universitaires pour trouver un groupe. Si ça vous intéresse, vous pouvez vous rendre sur www.gbu.fr. Et on remercie encore une fois John Lennox, notre orateur. Merci beaucoup de l'intervention que vous avez donnée, des réponses aux questions. Et on va s'arrêter là. Je vous remercie à vous tous qui avez regardé cet événement ce midi. Et je vous rappelle que vous pouvez toujours retrouver le replay de cette vidéo sur notre chaîne YouTube From Veritas France. Merci et bonne journée. Bonne journée.